Hello, everyone. Uh, welcome to our virtual event tonight. We're presenting The Art of Costuming from the Page to Stage featuring Sarah Borjo. Uh, before we begin, I just wanted to let you know about a few virtual events that are happening now and happening soon. So for the first time ever, our uh, Broadway series will be presented virtually. Um, these amazing artists in our series have worked really hard to evolve their show into something you can enjoy from the comfort of your own home this year. Um, currently available are Storm Large in Concert, Constantine Marulis presents uh, Quarantine with Constantine, and Jazz Meets Broadway, starring Anne Hampton Calloway. These performances are all available uh, for a seven day rental through Vimeo On Demand, um, but they will only be available till August 31st. So do not delay, make sure you rent them so you can enjoy them while they're still available. Um, our next play reading will be Constellations uh, by Nick Payne, and that will take place next week, Thursday, July 30th. This play explores how even the smallest change in our lives can dramatically alter the course we take. It's an exploration of love, science, quantum theory, and infinite possibility for heartbreak or for hope. Um, and if you are able to, please consider making a donation to Kate May Stage. All donations are tax deductible and your charitable gift can help us create even more virtual events. I will very patiently wait to return to our home at the Robert Shackleton Playhouse in Cape May. Uh, to make a donation, you can visit katemaystage.org. There's a donate button right at the top. You can click right there. Um, and while you're watching tonight's presentation, please let us know if you have any questions for Sarah. Uh, the Vimeo streaming page, if you're there, it has a specific spot on the bottom right to ask questions. And if you're watching via Facebook, just feel free to comment on the video and our marketing director will relay the question to us. So without further ado, let's bring on Roy and Sarah. All right, got you unmuted, Roy. You're unmuted, okay. Welcome, enjoy. Thanks for having, being with us, Sarah. Thanks for having me. <laughs> Hello, everyone. We're so grateful you could join us. And, uh, you know, during this time that our theater is closed, we have this really marvelous opportunity to share some of the wonderful people we work with. And I'm, I'm here with my wife, Marlena Lustig, and both of us had the, the really the honor and privilege of working with Sarah, both as actors. We did Lion in Winter with her as, an, as actors. And I've had numerous experiences working with you as a director. And I think Marlena has as well. So mm -hmm. um, tell us a little bit, I mean, you know, long before the actors even uh, are here, you have a relationship with directors. And I was just hoping that you could give us just a window into how you begin your work. Okay, uh, yeah. Um, well, I'll tell you, uh, I initially got into costume design as an actor myself, um, but I was not very, not very good at acting, let's uh, put it that way. But I really, I'd always loved clothes and costumes, so costume design was kind of a natural fit and still let me, it gave me a real collaborative voice that is very different from that of an actor. Um, it's a lot of working hands-on with all the design elements and the directors especially. Uh, and so when we, uh, when I'm hired to do a show, like my first show at Cape May Stage was outside Mullingar back in 2017. Uh, Roy called me up and asked me if I'd be interested in coming on board. I'm from Cape May originally. I'm actually broadcasting to you tonight from my parents' house in Cape May, where I've been hiding out in this pandemic. Um, so Roy and I knew each other uh, through, you know, the local, the local channels. Uh, so he sent me the Outside Mullingar script, and that's really where the process as a costume designer begins is, is, of course, with the script, because the purpose of costumes is to help tell the story of the play, as it is with all the design elements. Uh, costumes are unique because, of course, they're very character-centric, uh, more so than just the world-centric, but really it's about telling the individual arcs of these characters that we watch throughout the course of the show. <laughs> And so um, when I get a script, I'll do a lot of like breakdowns and paperwork. And, um, and then there's a conversation with the director and I'll talk a little bit more about this um, throughout my presentation. But um, 
there's a lot of back and forth. Uh, a good relationship with the director means a lot of communication and keeping the lines open and really kind of leaning into each other's suggestions where it's appropriate, and, uh, but always serving the story of the play primarily. <laughs> Well, you certainly do that. Why don't you give us your presentation? I'll just sit back and listen. <laughs> okay, fair enough. Uh, let me see. All right, so. Costuming from the page to the stage. So in theater, what we always wanna emphasize is the importance of storytelling, as I was saying. And primarily as costume designers, we do our storytelling through the clothing, the accessories, and the hair and makeup of the actors. And so what we are trying to communicate with those individual elements are the who, what, whens, and wheres primarily of the show. So we ask ourselves, who is this character in you know, kind of a broad sense, but then also you know, like what's their socioeconomic status? What's their religious upbringing? What's their occupation? What's their background like? How old are they? <laughs> Uh, what's their relationship to other characters? What's the mood of the scene? What is the character trying to communicate to the world um, as, you know, as they see themselves? Who are they trying to project to the other characters in the show? Um, when is this show? You know, what year is it? What time of year is it? What day of the time of day is it? Um, you know, how is time passing from scene to scene? <laughs> And where are we, you know, what kind of environment are we in? Are we in a really spe specific location? You know, is it a certain city? Is it somewhere really rural? Is it, you know, somewhere kind of in no man's land? You know, is it a little more uh, loosely defined than that? But ultimately it's about um, how we convey all of this through clothing. That's what costume design asks the question of. And so the first step we, the first stage for us is in approaching the script. As I was saying, we do a lot of, I do a lot of paperwork. I'll do like a first read of a script just to kind of get a handle on what the arc of the story is, what's happening, if it's a script I'm not familiar with. Um, ideally, it's just a quick cold read, just first impressions. Then on my second read, I'll start doing my breakdown. So I'll do a scene breakdown that'll ultimately turn into what we call a costume plot. But the scene breakdown covers a number of different things that I'm gonna need to be able to keep track of throughout the production to better serve the storytelling. And there are things like, when are the act breaks? When are the scene breaks? What are the page numbers that each character is on? Where are each of the locations within the show? What time of year is it? What time of day is it? What's the weather of the scene, if that's relevant? What are the comings and goings of the characters? Who is on stage in a scene? Who's off stage? Um, what's happening in the scene? What are the actual events that are taking place? And are there any specific references that I need to you know, factor into my design process? You know, If it says like, hang up your coat, then obviously I need to have a coat for them to hang up. Um, and I actually, I have a sample of a scene breakdown if uh, Mitchell if you want to show them I think that's in one of our our other tabs I have we have the uh, chapter two scene breakdown one more there we go so this document kind of gives me like the show at a glance so when I'm you know out shopping or you know juggling a couple of projects I can look at this document and immediately you know I can get the answers to my questions I can get a good you know overarching view of the whole production. And so obviously I break it down. I include what the transition times are between scenes. So I know how long cast members have to change clothes. And then a lot of detail at the bottom of what's going on in the scene. Who are these characters? And it just helps me stay organized and on track. And the real difference between this and a costume plot is that the plot kind of happens once we have the designs in a little more in place. It's that kind of is an ongoing document. Uh, and so then I'll say, okay, this render, you know, they're wearing this costume here and it's, you know, all of these pieces, but this is basically where we begin with building our plot and is from the scene breakdown. I also do what I call a looks list, which is sort of um, another element to the costume plot. It's a plot is basically the two combined and this breaks down, you know, how many looks does each character have? When are they changing? What are the shifts? And so 
you can see like each character had roughly like five to 10 looks for chapter two. So then going off of that initial paperwork, now that I've kind of got my thoughts together, I know what the logistics of the show are and I kind of have an initial impression of what's happened, what the play feels like, what it is saying to me. Then I move on, then that's usually when I'll have my first conversation with our director. <laughs> and we'll cover a number of things about the show. Um, and we might do this in person, we might do it over the phone or over Zoom or Skype, depending on what everyone's, you know, where everyone is in the world at the time. Uh, but we'll talk about what the overall production concept is. This is, you know, especially something that we address when dealing with like a Shakespeare, which, you know, you could set in its original Elizabethan era, or, you know, in the case of like Midsummer, the ancient Greek. But, um, but you could also update it. You could set it in modern days. You could set it in post-apocalyptic futures. Um, so with a show like that, there's usually a, a conversation of what we really want to do with it, what we think is going to be best for telling the story today. Uh, we'll also talk about characters, what their relationships are to each other. We'll talk about all those questions that I mentioned at the beginning of the presentation, you know, the who's, the what's, the when's and the where's. Um, what their individual character arcs are and their histories, their personalities, and like what's sticking out to both the director and I about them. We'll talk about any uh, movement concerns that we know up front. You know, if it's, a, uh, if it's a musical, there's obviously a number of dancing questions that will come up immediately. Or if there's a stage fight, we'll talk about, you know, what does that look like? Are we gonna need stage blood? Um, just the, some logistical concerns. Uh, well, I'll check in to see what's going on with the other design elements at this point, because usually scenic designers are working a little bit ahead of the costume designers. So there may be some sort of rough plan in place for the world, for the, uh, the larger visual world of the show. So it's helpful if I can get, uh, start getting my eyes on what that looks like. Uh, and we'll talk about casting uh, and, you know, seeing who, if there's anyone already under contract for the show, or if there's anyone we have in mind, any roles we don't have a clue who we're going to fill, because the actor themselves, of course, is a huge force in what the final product winds up looking like for a show. <laughs> and so from there, I'll continue to reread and revisit the script throughout the design process. Uh, but after that initial conversation, I can kind of jump into the research part of costume design. And what do we research? We kind of start big, at least I do. I start kind of just a general grabbing of things that jump out to me and I work down to more specifics. And obviously a lot of costume research is visual because it's a visual medium. Uh, but I'll also, you know, I'll start reading up on all of these questions, especially things like the, the whens and the wheres. Um, and then after I've kind of like started finding a few things that I like, it might, you know, I might do kind of like a big general gathering for, you know, a day or so, or it might not even be that long, depends on the project. Then I kind of move on to specifics, uh, you know, to research specifics for the show. So I'll ask, you know, the questions of what's going on in the world at large, or, you know, in terms of politics or major world events. Uh, where are we in terms of scientific advancements and key political figures? I'll ask what's going on culturally in the world in terms of like art and pop culture and celebrities, you know, who are the style icons of the day? Uh, what sort of literature and magazines are coming out at this point historically? Then I'll ask what's going on in the clothing world, you know, we're kind of narrowing down even more. Um, and I'll usually get a good handle on kind of all aspects of clothing, but obviously we'll get more specific depending on what the show is and uh, what the individual character stories are. But, you know, clothing research that I'll do could be research on women's wear, men's wear, children's wear, types of fabrics, uh, colors and patterns that we'll see in a lot of clothing of the day. Uh, any you know, common occupation uniforms, or, you know, if we know this character has a specific job in the show, then I'll definitely look into what that occupation would wear. You know, if it's a farmer, what, is, what does the farmer's outfit look like at this point historically? I look into shoes and underwear and outerwear. 
They cover accessories such as like handbags and ties and hats and jewelry and just all kinds of details. We, there's a lot to learn about every historical period in terms of its clothing and what that also says about the larger time itself. Uh, we'll also, I'll also research hair and makeup, you know, men's, women's, are we wearing synthetic hair colors at this point or, um, or false colors? What are the silhouettes? How do they achieve them? You know, so that we can replicate them on stage because oftentimes there are really specific processes for how these hairstyles were achieved. And if I'm going to use an actor's hair, I need to have a handle on what that, you know, on how real people achieved these hairstyles back in the day. Um, also like what sort of cosmetics were we seeing at the time? What is the social acceptance of cosmetics at the time? Obviously that changes throughout history. Um, I'll research regional specifics on all of these above points, you know, so with a show like Outside Mullingar, which is set in Ireland, you know, there was a lot of researching about Ireland going on and then any additional character specifics that might be mentioned in the text. And then how do I research? Um, there's a number of ways to do costume research, but these are some of the most common. Obviously the internet is a huge resource of information, not just in terms of Google imaging, but also in finding databases, you know, for different museums. I spend a lot of time, you know, scouring the Mets database, um, finding articles, blog posts. I watch YouTube clips of folks who do a lot of like historical reenactments. They, you know, take you through the process of getting dressed. The internet is just a wealth of information, obviously. Uh, and in costume design, it's no different. We use a lot of books. There's about a million books written on uh, all manners of clothing questions that you could have. My Amazon wish list is, I think it's about 60 pages long right now. It's just costume books. Uh, I look into magazines and newspapers and uh, photographs, obviously. Sometimes if it's a modern show, I'll do social media creeping just on different regions to see what, you know, like what real people are wearing. Uh, documentaries, sometimes movies. Uh, but of course, with movies, you have to remember you're looking at another artist's interpretation of a world. So take movies with a grain of salt. Uh, we prefer primary source documents as far as costume research goes. I'll visit museums and look at paintings and visual art samples, uh, fashion plates in terms of historic, really historical fashion, and vintage and historical garments. I'll look at the real thing if I can get access to them. And from there, I take all of this research that I've amassed and I've, whoop, actually, let's go back one slide, Mitchell. Uh, and I'll organize it kind of into individual character boards um, where I sort of pick, um, I sort through, I've kind of gathered it all together. And then I start saying, oh, this image speaks to me about this character or, oh, this is that, you know, that one specific thing for that character. And I'll collage them kind of like you can see here with the research boards that I did for the Shuck back in 2018. Uh, where I sort of, you know, I just started amassing like shoes or just what's speaking to me. It might be a texture, it might be an accessory. And that sort of helps me start to hone in on how we're actually going to make these costumes materialize before us. And from there, I share that information with the director and the rest of the creative team. And we'll have some back and forth about, you know, what's working, what isn't, what we like, what we don't. Um, and at this point, I'll also start to kind of build a pieces list. Uh, and I think we have a sample of a pieces list in one of the other tabs. And this is rough. This is kind of an, this is a document that evolves over time. So this is actually the final pieces list for chapter two that we did. And it also includes all of the laundry instructions, but that we'll get to a little bit later. But, and for me, the initial go at a pieces list might just look like shirt, pants, shoes, et cetera, you know, hat, coat. Uh, and then as I kind of refine what my design is gonna be, or we actually start selecting pieces that we're going to use, then we'll add in better descriptors and, you know, kind of take away the placeholder and, you know, get more specific with it. But we share these with the actors so that they can kind of track where they are in the show, especially with a show like chapter two, which had, 
a number of costume changes. It was helpful for the actors to have these on their mirrors. They could reference them you know, throughout the course of the show and kind of know where they're going in terms of their visual arc. And so once we've kind of agreed on where the rough visual research is going, then I move into the sketches and renderings process, which, there we go. And so a costume sketch for me is a no color pencil sketch where I'm kind of taking this initial visual research and turning it into a look. <laughs> Uh, but it's rough, you know, it shouldn't be something that's too pretty because it's still very much a work in progress at this point. Uh, a lot of times I'll leave off faces. I, I drew a face on here, but as you can see, it's kind of just a couple of rough little lines. Um, but it's primarily designed to focus on the silhouette and the shape of the costume as opposed to color and texture as much at this point. Uh, but it kind of helps us helps me communicate what the visual research is starting to materialize and you know, form a harder picture of in my mind. I can show this to the rest of my creative teammates and the director and you know, kind of get their input on it going forward. And then once the sketches have been approved, then we move on to renderings, which are right on the right. You can see it's a full color. It's you know, the pretty picture that you show uh, you know, on your social media and uses advertising, but it's the, the nicer version that has color, texture, real faces. It really kind of is a big jumping point in helping actors, you know, kind of see themselves in the character. So I'd usually, if I can, try and use an actor's real face and real hair when possible, unless you know they're going to be in a wig. Uh, but it's a much more realized process. However, it's important to remember with rendering, even with a rendering that, you know, is very clean and polished is that it's, it's not a, a hard and fast copy. You know, it's not always a direct translation from rendering to the stage. It's still a tool of communication in terms of like how we get there. Uh, and that, that process kind of evolves over time. <laughs> we, I have a few samples of some of the renderings from the greats that you'll see. You can use a lot of different uh, artistic mediums to create various renderings, but you'll often see watercolor, gouache, acrylics, markers, or digital renderings. Those seem to kind of be among the most common versions out there. Uh, every designer has their own style, which they'll often adjust and play with uh, to kind of reflect the styles and themes of a specific production. So as you can see, like with Paul Taswell's sketch of Jefferson for Hamilton, obviously he didn't put any real color into that because most, as if you've seen Hamilton, you know, they wear parchment colored bases and then the pieces that go on top are kind of the color. So instead he included the swatches of what the fabrics look like. And so pretty much all of the Hamilton renderings are in this parchment colored, you know, no color, just line work rendering style with the additional swatches added on top of it. Uh, but if you flip through, you can see a few more samplings. These are just some of the finest. You can see there's quite a range and everyone has their own way of doing it, their own body types, their own poses. Yeah, <laughs> but they're all pretty stunning. So I'm going to take you through real quick. When I did outside Mullingar, so this is where I initially, the initial research I would have submitted was the character boards for each of the characters. And I did, I broke them down into like little groupings just for ease, but I started with looks at the beginning and then we moved through the show. And I also like piped in a background of Ireland behind it so that we kind of got that rough and rural sense of, you know, how it might look kind of in the scenic world, these sorts of pieces. And then from there, yeah, there's the rest of them. Oh, I also included uh, in the case of Mullingar, since it was a, a farm piece and I knew we'd be buying a lot of clothing new, but we'd have to make it look like it had been used on the farm any number of times. I also did um, a distressing board, a distressing research board so that 
like when I showed my my cohort, my assistant at the time, you know, this board, we could say, oh, okay, we want the distress work that we do with paints and cheese graters and markers and all manner of things to kind of look like this. Uh, and it gave us, you know, that helped us transform these new clothes into things that look like they'd actually been used and worn many times over. And from there, I move on to the sketches. So I took all of those <clears throat> initial research boards and then I kind of abstracted things that I liked from them, things that, you know, were speaking to Roy from them. And I created these kind of like rough faceless pencil sketches to give us a starting point. And then off of those, yeah, there's a few more. Then I moved to the rendering stage. And I, I like to do mine digitally a lot of the time, partly because I travel a lot and it's easier for me to just take my laptop and or my iPad and do it um, on screen rather than toting around, you know, all my paints and markers. Um, so in this case this is a set of digital ones, not that I don't do marker or paint occasionally, but a lot of my renderings are digital. And so we kind of move through those. And then you can see a progression of where we started with the research where we move to in the sketch, where I move to in the rendering, and then what the final product looks like on stage. <laughs> you can see that for both Chris and Annie who are starring in the show. There we go. And that's a soup to nuts point of the process. <laughs> Now, in the case of a show like The Taming, which I designed at Cape May Stage this past uh, September, I guess it was, um, the first costume that uh, Lauren Gunderson describes is the Flag Angel costume. And it's, I think it says something, Marlena, help me out with this. It's something <laughs> like flags are popping up and she's spectacular and over the top, but it's, it's kind of like a rough description, yes? Yeah, the thing is also, it's the beginning of the show. And, as, and it's a comedy and you really want it to have it be very theatrical and very funny. And this is a, a woman who is auditioning. This is her big number and she has to make a big splash. So I kept telling you, it, you can go so over the top. If she has fireworks coming out of her hair, that's fine with me. <laughs> it has to be spectacular. And from then on, you came up with the most spectacular, beautiful costume. <laughs> Thank yeah. you. This was sort of where we started with the research board for that. Since we knew we wanted it to feel like an American flag, I kind of just started with looking and seeing what other crazy American flag costumes folks had come up with over the years. But ours evolved to look a little bit different from any of these. But you can see it in the next slide. <laughs> right? But she still kind of kept some of that essence of that original board, which was that over the top, uber patriotic, red, white, and blue you know, cacophony of fun. And she wish, lit up. And she lit up. She did I light up. The <laughs> I wish we had the video of this one because up. it literally pops up like angel wings. It was absolutely incredible, my lord. <laughs> oh, I know. I wish I had a copy of that video. Maybe we can find it for the end of this presentation. Um, all right. So now that we've kind of set the designs in place, once they've all been approved, rendering sketches, research, all got the stamp of approval to start, then we move into costume production, which asks the question, now, who makes the costumes happen? So you know a little bit about what I do as the designer. Um, there's a couple of departments that really work in costumes, and you'll see variations of this at theaters across the country, kind of depending on size and scale and, you know, what the needs of the, the theater are for its costume team. But in terms of the design field, you have the designer, and then you, your designer may have an associate or an assistant, especially on like a Broadway level, or, you know, like a, a high ranking Lort theater. Um, and then sometimes you'll have a shopper, you also have shoppers in television and film often who there, that's their job. They go shop, they do shopping, and they do some of the returns. Uh, the assistant and the associate designers might also help with some of the shopping, but they'll also support the designer by building paperwork and doing some general sourcing of items, especially like online sourcing. Uh, they'll take a lot of notes in the fittings and take fitting photos. 
Uh, they may help with coordinating rehearsal items for uh, the production and general returns. They may help track the budget. Uh, associates and assistants are great people to have around and you should always treat them with love and respect. Uh, you also might have a management team, a costume shop manager or costume director, supervisor. There's different titles, uh, but roughly they kind of run the, the shop side of the affair, which at a regional theater, you might have a costume shop that will actually, you know, build uh, build your production for you right in house. Whereas in New York, you job your show out to different shops that are around the city and a shop may be working on, you know, like all kinds of productions, 20 productions at a time, cruise ships and Broadway and shows across the country. Um, that's more like a commercial model for um, shop managing. But um, in terms of like a regional theater shop manager, They'll usually handle things like coordinating fittings and getting those scheduled. They'll track, they'll also help with show budget tracking and making sure that there's petty cash and credit cards available for shopping, placing some of the orders. Uh, they might liaise with some of the local resources. You know, they'll know if like the college in the area is good to rent from for your kind of show. Uh, they'll hire the over hire, they'll hire the technical team that works at the theater. Uh, so the management, yeah, it, it handles managing. Uh, the technician team handles the actual building and the execution of the alterations and craft work on the pieces for the show. You've got your drapers and stitchers, drapers and tailors, actually. Um, they will handle like the patterning and the cutting and they're sort of, they're the in charge, you know, they're kind of like the top dogs. And then your stitchers, your first hands um, will uh, actually piece it together. They'll be uh, sewing on different projects all day. They might do, you know, they'll do things like hemming and hemming in pants, you know, that you bought from the store or putting a, a piece together, you know, soup to nuts that the draper has patterned and cut for them. Uh, and then you might also have some specialty artisans. A lot of times, sometimes those won't be in-house depending on the size of the theater. You may have to job that out. Uh, some theater companies will have their own specialty teams in-house like dyers and agers, milliners, uh, beaters and embroiderers, glove makers, leather workers, et cetera, et cetera. <laughs> uh, and then the fourth tier of the team is wardrobe. Uh, the backstage team consists of a wardrobe supervisor and dressers and they handle the daily maintenance of a show. So they deal with repairing any rips or tears and costumes that come up during the run. They handle daily show prep, which is laundry, steaming, ironing, et cetera, presetting costumes in the wings for quick changes. They also will run the show. They'll handle the offstage changes in the wings. A lot of times they're very fast. You know, you feel as an audience member, like a lot of time has passed because, you know, we, the lighting may shift, it may look like, oh, it's a new day. But of course, in reality, only a few seconds have passed and we have to get an actor out of one costume and into another very quickly to help with telling that story of time passing. Uh, so the wardrobe team will help with that. They'll keep things stocked backstage like bobby pins, makeup remover, detergent for laundry. They'll handle show laundry and they will also handle things like dry cleaning, drop, drop offs and pickups throughout the show. Uh, and you may also have a hair and makeup team that's separate that handles, you know, wig styling, wig upkeep, um, you know, helping actors get into hair and makeup each day, uh, helping actors get wigged because it's difficult to wig yourself as an actor. It's usually better to have a friend help you out. Uh, and yeah, and so those are basically the teams that you might encounter working at a, a theater in the costume department. <laughs> <laughs> but mostly at Cape May Sage, it's you. <laughs> yeah. It's me and, um, and our like costume assistant wardrobe supervisor kind of combo position usually. <laughs> but, uh, yeah. Yeah, we wear, we wear a few hats at Cape May stage. <laughs> like I'll get a lot more hands-on than sometimes I would if I'm, you know, 
at, at, at some other theaters. Sometimes as the designer, I'll only come in for fittings and then I'll be gone again until tech week. It's, uh, it's changeable depending on, you know, how best I'm able to support the show and what level of support the show does need from me. Uh, so how do we start putting all of this together? Uh, we do budgeting. <laughs> Uh, you can do a line item budget where you, you know, plan for every pair of socks and, you know, every, uh, you know, whole piece of thread that you need. Uh, I find that that's a little time consuming. So a lot of times I'll do it by look where I'll take the total budget number that I've been given. I'll separate out some extraneous costs, you know, I'll, I'll guesstimate what those are. And then I'll take the number that's left and I'll divide it by the number of looks that I'm expecting to be putting together. And then that kind of gives me a ballpark for how much I can spend on each look for the show. And I can go up and down depending on what I'm able to find for free or cheap and what's going to cost more than I expected it to cost. Um, some of the additional budget expenses that you might run into as a costume designer that you need to remember to factor in are uh, the cost of new sewing and craft materials, such as, you, you know, you might only need a new spool of thread or you might need you know, 300 rhinestones to bedazzle that dress. And so you have to factor that in. Uh, you'll be facing shipping costs for any online orders, including a lot of returns. Some places don't have the prepaid returns. Uh, I like to set aside a contingency, usually like seven to 10% for any tech week surprises that might come up or, you know, just any changes that we decide to make once we see it all on stage together. Uh, if there's not a separate hair and makeup budget, I usually set some money aside for that. Uh, wardrobe for any specialty wardrobe needs that might not just be backstage already. Um, stage blood's a common one. You know, you might need materials to make certain stage bloods. Every blood reacts differently with different fibers. So you can also be looking at a number of like blood tests if you're doing a show that has a lot of blood in it uh, and certainly a lot of cleanup and then any dry cleaning costs if there isn't a separate budget set aside for that as well. <laughs> so how do we actually get the costumes? Well, <laughs> there's really four main ways that you would start to put a rack together for a show. Uh, and they all have different price points. You can start with stock, which most regional theaters will have. And it's it basically consists of pieces that have been used in previous productions. They're all usually organized by like item type, sometimes by era, you know, if, the, if it's a really striking silhouette, uh, you'll have old shoes, old, you know, socks and <laughs> uh, t-shirts, jeans, and you can kind of go through what your theater has in stock and pull out things that might work for you and your cast. Uh, and that's usually free. Uh, so that's always a great place to start if your budget's a little tight. Uh, you might rent something, which is, you know, which you could rent from another theater. You could go to their stock and borrow from them. And everyone has different price points on their rentals. Uh, in New York and LA, you can visit actual costume rental houses, such as uh, the TDF Costume Collection, where we rented the Lion and Winter costumes from. And they have a huge warehouse full of, you know, basically costume stock. Costume stocks all kind of look like this, um, but this one's a much larger scale. <laughs> you might also purchase, which is pretty straightforward and self-explanatory, but um, we shop at all different kinds of vendors as costume designers. We might shop at Amazon and Zappos or Etsy, or there's a lot of specialty vendors out there too. You know, for example, if you're looking for reproduction vintage shoes, you might check out Remix Vintage, Royalty Vintage, or American Duchess. They all have, they all deal in uh, reproduction vintage shoes. And then we also may build a piece from the ground up. And for that, it's helpful to have a really clear rendering because this is something that you'll have a lot more creative control over than you have with the other three, because in theory, you know, you are making it from scratch. And so you can kind of really refine and tweak it to get it exactly how you want it or more or less exactly how you want it. Uh, and on the next slide, I think we have, have a sample of some of the build process. So for 
the, this production of uh, Turn of the Screw I did at theater at Monmouth back in 2015. We pulled that skirt from stock, but we built the top of the dress for our governess. And so I did what we call a working drawing, which uh, kind of breaks down all the lines. You know, is this a seam? Is this a dart? Where are the trims? What fabrics are we using here? Is it lined? Is it not lined? Uh, it answers all the questions. And if I do a good enough job, I can usually send this on ahead and the draper can kind of get started uh, on the build before I get there. Uh, or we may have a little phone conference or we may have a, an in-person conference depending on the size and scope of the show. Um, I'll usually do a separate research board that's more about the details of the build. Um, so as you can see in the bottom left-hand corner there, you know, I included samples of like, this is what's happening at the neckline. You know, this is prob this is the shape of the bustle that I think we're gonna use underneath of it. This is sort of what I want the trim to be doing at the bottom. This is the amount of fullness. There's a lot of questions that come up in builds. And so, well, with these two documents, I, you know, we try and have these as reference points to help keep the process from running smooth smoothly with a build. And so now that we've got some options for all these pieces, we move on to the fitting stage. Uh, I can't show you any actual fitting photos, even though my phone is always full of them uh, because uh, you know, you're not supposed to share fitting photos outside of your creative team. But here's a few fitting kind of esque images that you can enjoy. Um, typically an actor will arrive for a predetermined amount of fitting time that will work out with stage management based on how many looks we're hoping to see that day. Um, we may have one fitting with an actor, we may have many. It depends on, again, size and scope of the production and what the needs of the costumes are, uh, how often they can be spared from rehearsal. <laughs> Um, along with the designer and the actor, in a fitting you might find your costume shop manager and director and your draper, you might find your assistant designer. And then a lot of times we'll have other people come and go, you know, if there's a stitcher who's working primarily on a build for this actor, you know, they may be part of the fitting. If there's a, a big craft project build, then you may have a craft artisan in there. Uh, so it fluctuates. Occasionally the director will stop by and watch a fitting. Uh, so you can have a number of people in a fitting up to, I think I've, the most I've had is about 10, uh, which was a very full fitting room. <laughs> uh, fitting typically includes wa walking through the designs verbally with the actors. Or, uh, you know, I usually will try and have a copy of the renderings and the research in the room so that you know, they can kind of see how I got from these steps in the process to the clothes on the rack themselves. And then we'll go through each look one by one try a number of different combinations and take photos of all of them. We'll pin them uh, in a way that's the most flattering and conducive to the actor's body. And, you know, we'll take a lot of notes on what we want to change and what we need to try again with. I won't typically go in, I'll try not to, <laughs> I try not to go into a fitting with only one single option for a piece. It's, my goal point is usually a at least three to five, but maybe up to 10 options for a single piece. Uh, and you find out pretty quickly when you get into a fitting what's working and what isn't working. Uh, and it's a big, at this point, there's a lot of collaboration happening with the actor because the actors have been doing in-depth character studies on just this character. And so while I have a sense of what's going on in the whole show, and I've of course spent some time with their character as a designer, they really have been doing a lot of legwork on the research and they may have some different ideas from what I'm presenting to them. And, you know, we have a lot of dialogue back and forth and we talk, you know, we talk about what's been happening in rehearsal, you know, what's the blocking looking like, how are they able to move in each of the options um, and any discoveries that they've made or backstory that they've built for their character that may be, isn't in the text, but you know, is kind of helping drive their performance um, as an actor. And all of that is something that we kind of factor in and continue to build off of throughout the rest of the production process until we get to opening night. Um, yeah, we make a lot of discoveries and fittings and yeah, it's great. It's a really fun part of the process. <laughs> 
uh, once we've settled on some things that we like, you know, I may still be shopping and reworking some looks, but alterations can start once we've got a, a firm go ahead from director or end designer. Uh, and you might see there are sewing alterations as simple as a pant hem, as complicated as, you know, rebuilding an entire jacket that I've purchased. I've definitely done that before. Um, just because you love the pattern and, you know, it's got to be this pattern. <laughs> um, you might see quick change rigging alterations for those fast changes that happen in the wings that need to feel like a lot of time has passed, but in actuality has not. Uh, we do a lot of concealed like snap closures or zippers, sometimes Velcro. Uh, so you'll see those sorts of alterations going on. We do elastic and shoelaces. I'm giving away all of my secrets right now, but, <laughs> uh, but that's the magic of theater and that's how we make it feel magical. Uh, and we might do craft alterations, you know, such as rhinestoning, uh, you know, a dress or when I built the angel wings for a uh, flag angel, you know, that was considered kind of a crafty project or a craft build or craft alteration. Uh, here I've got a sample of like, this was a brand new pair of Uggs that I was told to uh, to salt treat, you know, make them look like they'd been worn out in salt and slush a number of times. So I did all of that with uh, paint and like a cheese grater or a, you know, a hard brush. I think I took them out in the the rain and walked around in the puddles with them for a little bit. You can get kind of creative with how you go about distressing pieces. And so once we've got our alterations kind of moving and underway, then there's also the rehearsal process to think about in terms of a designer's role in it. Oh, I'm running out of time. Um, so I'll typically, I'll try and attend the uh, first rehearsal if possible and uh, which is usually a table read. And a lot of times there's design presentations for the cast and the rest of the company who hasn't seen it at that point. Um, I'll try and attend a designer run, which is one of the final runs in the rehearsal space before we move to the theater. It's usually done with rehearsal props and costume pieces and uh, sometimes some of the real show pieces like show shoes. And then there's tech and dress rehearsals where we put all of the design elements together. And I'll be looking as a designer at how it's all working together artistically, uh, but also what are the practical concerns that we're running into? You know, is someone, you know, are we tripping over skirts trying to climb the stairs? You know, is it not possible to make that quick change in time that we need to be making? Um, and that's sort of, those are things that we figure out once we actually see it all in the space together with scenic and lighting and sound. And then, that kind of brings me to the point of how do we collaborate with uh, the other design elements. With Scenic, a lot of times I'll be collaborating with them on what the colors and textures of the worlds are. Obviously they have to be somewhat harmonious, otherwise it's jarring to look at. Uh, the props department also falls under the Scenic department a lot of times. Uh, and so we'll work with them on hand props. And sometimes I will trade favors with the props department in terms of alterations. If I have a, you know, a build or a project that you know, uses a hard material that maybe I'm not as comfortable with, I might you know, ask the props department to help me out if I you know, hem their curtains. Uh, there's a lot of trading back and forth. Uh, and we also deal with certain practicalities with the scenic department, like um, with painted stage floors, you think about whether your shoe choices are gonna scuff them, whether your shoes need to be rubbered to accommodate a really slick floor. Um, are there gonna be tear points where if, you know, a fab where a fabric gets caught, you know, on a rough edge, is it gonna tear? Where are the hooks and quick change areas going to be backstage? So there's a lot of uh, liaising about those topics. Uh, in terms of working with the lighting department, um, I will look at any research imagery um, that they might have and try and get a handle on what their color palette is going to look like and what each scene's mood is going to feel like. You know, is it going to be hyper realistic or is it going to be kind of dreamlike and magical? Um, is it going to be cold lighting, warm lighting? <laughs> Those are all things that will help inform my process. Uh, if I'm using certain color choices in my costumes, I'll try and give them a heads up. We always talk about um, white on stage in costumes because white is a little tricky to light because it's very, it's very glaring. And so sometimes I will uh, do a, we call it a tech dye. And so I'll 
put it in a bath of uh, a dye bath of maybe like an oatmeal or like a light taupe just to take some of the harshness out of the white. But uh, if it's anything that's going to kind of read white on stage, I definitely want to give my lighting designer friends a heads up. Or if I'm changing colors during tech week, I want to give my lighting designer friend a heads up about that too, so that they can kind of plan around it. And to that end, I'll make sure to share fitting photos, you know, in a way that they can access them throughout the design process as we're working towards the final product. And with the sound department, there's, uh, we don't collaborate quite as directly at Cape May stage because we don't use body mics, but uh, in terms of musicals, uh, there's a lot of collaboration about where body mics are going to be placed on actors. Um, there's a number of places where you can hide a mic pack for an actor and where it is will depend on things like movement, number of costume changes, what the actor is most comfortable with, what's the fit of the costume, you know, is it really close fit or is it kind of loose? Um, and some of the places that you might find a mic pack that you wouldn't expect are, you know, center of the back, inside of the thigh, on bras or in bras, or concealed up in wigs. Those are pretty common ones. And so we'll liaise about that ahead of time so that it's not a surprise when we get to tech to figure out where we're going to hide these uh, mic packs. And we'll also talk about superfluous costume noise. Um, you know, like we don't usually use Velcro because that's a jarring sound or, you know, if we can avoid it, we try not to. Um, and sound, all sound is technically falling under the sound design category. So we try and be cognizant of that. And we work with stage management in terms of setting up fittings. Uh, they let us know, you know, when the actors could be spared from the rehearsal, they help coordinate that flow and keep communications coming from rehearsal, you know, if I, if a note comes up that, you know, someone would like a handbag for the scene or a handkerchief, they make sure that I know it so that I can make that happen for them, both in rehearsal and in the show itself. They let us know about any movement red flags that might crop up in rehearsal and any just requests for rehearsal items that would come up. They, and they help us uh, with support backstage as well. <laughs> Stage management is a key component of any theater. <laughs> and more or less in conclusion is that costumes takes a village to make show happen. And we're just, uh, you know, it takes a village to make costumes happen and a village to make a whole show happen. Uh, and it's a lot of fun as a job that's, it's kind of challenging at times. There's a lot of travel involved, which I love, but uh, can be a little exhausting. Uh, in a typical year, I'll either design or assist on somewhere between 15 to 20 shows uh, all over the place, usually all up and down the East uh, in many different theaters. And every day is really a new challenge that's full of surprises and there is no end to what you can learn as a costume designer. <laughs> that's awesome. So that was fantastic. Oh, uh, it was so informative. Um, I have a few questions and oh. comments from our viewers. Excellent. First, um, Nancy O'Malley George just wants to say hi and she thought this was so interesting. Uh, she's been going to Cape May stage for about 10 years. She's seen most of the shows oh. you designed and she especially loved the American flag costume you designed. Oh, uh, it was spectacular on stage and she said thank you for tonight. It's been a lot of fun. So oh, thank, thank you for joining us Nancy. Um, we also have Alice. Uh, she says hi and she wants to know how many of the jobs you've gotten into create um, how many of the jobs that go into creating costumes have you actually had to learn? Oh my goodness. <laughs> that's a, that's a multifold question. Um, aside from designer, I have worn the hat of assistant designer and associate designer, which are, are close, closely related. Um, I've been a wardrobe supervisor a number of times and a dresser a handful of times. So I've had that backstage aspect as well. Uh, I have done some stitching. I'm not the greatest stitcher, I admit, but <laughs> I have worked as a stitcher on occasion um, and as an intern in bigger shops when I was first starting out. And I think one of the only jobs I guess I haven't had is um, shop manager yet. So. Maybe one of these days I'll, I'll put that hat on. But a lot of times, like especially with my shows in the city, um, if I can't afford to job them out to other shops, I wind up wearing kind of my own shop manager hat. So, mm -hmm. you know, I think I think I could make that jump if I needed to. 
but <laughs> Sarah, I think I think people may be amused to oh. <laughs> to hear about uh, when you were talking about uh, maintaining costumes. Mm -hmm. One of the things you had was vodka spray. Mm -hmm. What is vodka spray? <laughs> vodka spray. Well, it's. It's somewhat exactly what it sounds like. Uh, vodka is one of those like costumer magic secret weapons that we use. Uh, we'll go out and we'll buy a cheap handle of vodka, you know, like the cheapest one they've got at the liquor store. And there's some, some arguments about what the exact ratio is, but um, usually I do 50-50. We'll put it in a spray bottle, 50% vodka, 50% water, uh, and then between shows, if a garment can't really be washed between shows or dry cleaned between shows in order to keep it kind of fresh or at least not as funky, uh, fresh kind of as a relative scale, um, we'll spray down costumes between runs with vodka spray. You know, we'll spray armpits and any major sweat points. Obviously with like dress shirts and things, we'll wash those between runs, but like with suits, you can't wash the suit every run and you can't practically send it out for dry cleaning between every run that would, you know, get very expensive very fast. So vodka spray is a good way to kind of uh, help prolong the garment's life and keep the budget costs a little bit lower. <laughs> That's another one of your secrets you're, you're letting out. Everybody's going to be using that at home now. It, it, it works. It's crazy. <laughs> Better than <laughs> <laughs> giving them all away. <laughs> um, a few other questions we had. Um, do all costume designers sew? Or are there costume designers that are specifically design oriented and, and not really involved in that side? Um, that's another multifold question. Um, most designers can sew somewhat. <laughs> um, you'll see a range of abilities in terms of sewing skills. Like I, as I said, I'm not the greatest of sewers, but I have enough skills to handle alterations on some of my own really low budget shows um, or to help support, you know, uh, my shops when I go in and we just have a lot of alterations and not enough hands, you know, I can jump on and take care of a certain amount of alterations. Um, it's important, it's more important to know how to talk about clothing and how to talk about um, the way clothing is put together, even if you can't necessarily do every single step yourself. But being able to like confer with a draper or a tailor about, you know, why this seam or why this dart placement and, you know, understand, you know, the way fabric is going to behave, the way each type of fabric is going to behave is, you know, quintessential to the job. There are a lot of um, most a lot of costume designers go for an MFA, Masters in Fine Arts, which is a typically a three year program. Um, I had got my MFA from the University of California at Irvine, and we were just a design program. We there are some that are a design tech, a design and tech combo program. Many of those actually out in the country. Um, we were just design. We still had costume craft classes. So, you know, I took classes in draping and millinery and distressing and fabric arts. And we didn't do a lot of sewing, but we all sort of came in with basic sewing skills. Mm -hmm. um, so there's a range, there's a range of abilities. As you get higher up in the organizations, you know, like you won't find your Broadway costume designers necessarily doing a lot of the sewing, uh, at least at the Broadway level. <laughs> But, uh, you know, sometimes those same designers may go to a smaller regional house and do a show and you will see them, you know, getting, rolling up their sleeves and getting their hands dirty. So uh, partly it depends on the venue and what's expected. <laughs> and then just a question about you. Do you find your own personal kind of design and style change when you're working on a show? If you're really focused on an era, um, I just, I had a vision of um, Line and Winter during the, the photo call. And I mm. saw you come out and I was like, is she in the play? Because it was this very uh, kind of like armor-esque outfit. And I don't know that's Sarah. She's the costume designer. So I'm just curious if that, if you find that happening with uh, the other shows that you work on as well. I told, I had that same sort of flashback when I was putting that picture in of the, the group at the end of Lion and Winter. Um, yeah, I definitely do. Especially in colors. Like I'll find, you know, I might find myself looking for a specific color uh, for my thesis show in grad school, uh, 
color that we were using a lot of was like a really like chartreuse snotty kind of green, like a really intense lime. And I found myself, you know, wanting to wear all kinds of lime items or, you know, getting excited every time I found a lime, a, a lime colored item while I was out in the world and, you know, gravitating towards it. I definitely will catch myself playing with more colors, uh, depending on what's a, a strong color through line in my show. And but Sarah, I, could yeah. you tell us a little bit about, because I think people might be interested in mm -hmm. working with the costume collection. What is that? And how do you do it? Oh, okay, yes. Um, so the costume collection, uh, the TDF costume collection, which is the Theater Development Fund, they uh, have a rental warehouse that's located in Astoria. Um, it's part of Kaufman Astoria Studios. It's down in their basement. Uh, and every rental house works a little bit differently, but that one, um, well, actually, they they just released some new policies today because of the pandemic. So how we do it is going to be a little bit different going forward. But prior to um, this unusual year that we're facing, uh, typically you could just go and visit the costume collection. Um, you could kind of look around if you want, but uh, but they're a rental house specifically. So when I go to the costume collection. I am going with a show in mind. Um, and so I'll set up an account for that show. A lot of theaters have accounts with the costume collection. And so there's a certain amount of coordination that happens to get a show set up. You know, we have to get, you know, it takes a couple of signatures, but once you're all set up uh, and you with them, then you go to the collection and you get an empty rack. They have a bunch of empty racks and you say, hey, I'm here to pull for Lion and Winter. And they say, okay, great. Are you going to check out today? And I say, no, probably not. Not today. And they say, okay, great. Then, you know, just remember to, you know, put your costumes in the back when you're done. And so I'll take an empty rolling rack um, and I'll start just walking the aisles and picking up things that I need. I always have a copy of, you know, cast measurements with me. I usually do them in a spreadsheet. So it's a, like a one sheet deal of, you know, everyone's sizes. Uh, and I'll have a copy of my pieces list, usually on my phone. I'll have copies of my research, also usually on my phone just for ease. Uh, and I always have to have a measuring tape or a tape measure um, <laughs> that I can kind of, you know, assess, is this actually going to fit my actor or not even close? Uh, and then I'll start just going through and I'll, you know, it's uh, organized at TDF usually by era uh, and sometimes by like items. So I'll just go to the items that I know I need and I'll start pulling out some options. I'll put them on a rack. Uh, you know, I try and go by character and by look and keep it in some order and, you know, fill up bags of shoes and accessories. And if I'm not ready to check out that day, then I will, you know, I'll tie I'll basically tie a, a rope around the costumes and put a tag on it that says, these are on hold for Cape May stage for Lion and Winter. And here's my name and number if you need to contact me about them. Because I may, you know, I may make this rack and then go away for a couple of days, do some other things and come back later. Or I may be back the next day. It kind of depends on my the schedule and my needs. Uh, sometimes we will have fittings at the costume collection like uh, Roy and Marlena and actually most of the cast came in for at least a first fitting at the costume collection for Lion and Winter. Uh, they have fitting rooms that you can sign out because if you take a costume out of the premises at costume collection, you do pay for it. Uh, so it's it helps keep you from just like taking a million options at, you know, and then they don't get stuck putting a billion things away that uh, you know, you didn't actually use or try on. So, so we arranged fitting times for everyone to come in to the costume collection itself. And we tried on all the options. I signed out the fitting rooms. And then I was sending photos to our director, John Gully at the time. And we were calling each other every day talking about, um, you know, how the racks were looking, how things were fitting and what we were both liking, what he wanted me to maybe see if I could find a different option for. And then I, you know, put back all the rejects and just checked out what we had selected and they were able to ship it right to Cape May stage. So I didn't have to haul a couple of huge boxes of medieval costumes through New York City. Not that we haven't done it before, but. 
Uh, but that's more or less how it works. And then uh, they have their own way of handling dry cleaning. You can send it back or you can dry clean it yourself. I think now with the pandemic, you have to dry clean everything before you send it back. Uh, but that's really, really how it works. Um, they charge by the piece or no, actually they charge by the look at costume collection. Um, so I think a costume is any combination of pieces you can wear at the same time. And I think you get up to 10 accessories with each costume. So they charge like by the costume um, and they give you your paperwork and you send it all back at the end of the show. And if anything's missing or destroyed beyond use, uh, then you have to pay for it. There are certain limitations on what alterations you can do with a rental garment. Like you can't cut it up, you can't distress it, you can't dye it. It has to be alterations that can be restored to, you know, the original state of the garment. <laughs> Sounds like fun. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> just gonna grab fun. a rack and oh. uh, just, just grab some stuff as I go. That's awesome. Yeah. Yeah. It's kind of like shopping. <laughs> <laughs> I could listen to you go on forever. Oh. But <laughs> we should wrap up, but if anybody has any additional questions that haven't been discussed, you can always email um, Roy, Roy at katemaystage.org. You'd be more than happy to forward the email to Sarah to get a response um, if you're watching this after the live stream. Um, but Sarah, this was ridiculously good. Um, it was oh, super thank you. <laughs> I mean, I'll be honest, I, you know, in my, Post-college days, I did some stitching at the New York Theater Workshop and did a lot of customer kind of stuff. And you really explained to a, a really succinct manner how many steps it takes to go <laughs> to get a costume on stage. You know, it, it doesn't dawn on a lot of people every intricate detail of it. So I really, I mean, I even learned from today. This was this was really oh, wonderful. Thank you. Yeah, thank absolutely. You. Yeah, and in, I, you know, I look closing, forward to it. time for us again. More flag angels. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. I was okay. going to say, in closing, I just wanted to share with you, I think, but I think it's a funny cautionary tale and ask if maybe you have one as well. I did a production of Macbeth many, many years ago. Oh. <laughs> and uh, you're not supposed to say that where you have to turn around three times and spit <laughs> in the theater. Yeah. yeah. Uh, but since we're not in the theater, I'll, I can say it. Mm -hmm. And the concept, this, this costume concept was skin tight leather. It was early Scotland. It was supposed to be, and we rehearsed. I was an actor. I was playing Macbeth. Uh, mm. We rehearsed in tights and, and bare chested. And we were in, um, of course, this is, I was a very young man at the time. Um, mm. We were wearing, um, we were doing big uh, broadswords and you know, that kind of very violent kind of movement. Mm. They couldn't mm. afford leather, skin tight leather. So they got skin tight vinyl. Oh, and okay. and so when we got to dress rehearsal, every elbow, every armpit, every crotch, you know, immediately was destroyed, and mm -hmm. I could see the entire costume department in the audience weeping <laughs> <laughs> because they had to completely redo all of the costumes. Oh. And but my point really was is that the costume designer and the mm -hmm. director in that case, they were both wonderful artists, but they didn't talk to each other. Mm -hmm. And the costume designer never actually came to rehearsal to see us rehearsing bare chested in tights. If she mm -hmm. had, she'd know that we couldn't possibly do what, you know, what they had built. Right. <laughs> oh, dear. <laughs> yeah. But I, I, I'm assuming, knowing working with you, that, you, that your communications, I mean, you're, you're extraordinarily wonderful to communicate oh, with. Thank you. <laughs> but have you ever had anybody who wasn't? <laughs> I, oh, yes, I have. I, I should have thought of some horror stories before this, because, of course, they've all flown right <laughs> out of my head right now. <laughs> um, but you're, you're right. Com communication is definitely key. So that entails, like, reading rehearsal reports regularly. And a lot of times I'll take somebody else with me to rehearsal because, you know, sometimes I just miss something or, you know, something that doesn't seem like a red flag to me might be more of a concern to someone else, you know? So I'll take my wardrobe team with me a lot, or if I have an assistant, I'll bring them. Uh, and that, you know, <laughs> yeah, it's just, uh, it's paying attention. It's, you know, making sure you talk with the actors a lot. You know, if they're like, oh, I have to get on my knees and, and do something. And I'll right. try and make them, you know, actually do it in the fitting. Cause sometimes an actor will 
you know, they'll be there in their costume and you're like, well, can you actually get down on your knees in this? And they're like, oh yeah, I'm sure it's fine. And I'm like, no, no, can you like, can you do it right now? So I can see that you can get down on your knees. <laughs> right. This is a problem later. I, you know, I'd, I'd rather solve it now if we can. <laughs> but right. Sarah, do you ever feel like you have to be a minor psychologist with the actors? Because we <laughs> could be a very sensitive and crazy breed at times. Mm. There's, yeah, I could probably do a whole a whole talk on um, on what it's like to be in the fitting room with an actor, um, but yes, yes, there's a lot of psychology that goes into it. Uh, the key thing with working with an actor in the fitting room is to just make sure that you're listening as much as possible and you're really letting them know that you're trying to hear their concerns and you want them to feel like their best self. You want to make sure that they feel great and confident on stage. You know, you're not trying to be their enemy here. You really want to support them. And that can, it can be a little, it can throw you for a loop, especially your first couple of times if you get an actor in and they just don't like what you've designed for them or, you know, you got the wrong measurements. Somebody sent an out of date set and so nothing's fitting. Like that can be a real, you know, you can really have a rough day when, when things are going sideways on you in a fitting. Um, but a great fitting feels amazing, you know, when you can really, you know, help an actor, you know, by stepping, they step into a costume and they say, oh, wow, this, this really informs my role. I was struggling with something about this and this costume just helped me make it make sense. Like that's such a good feeling. Um, but it really, it's really about communication with an actor. <laughs> As a producer, everything goes so smoothly when with you in that department. Oh. <laughs> so grateful. <laughs> and I, I join Mitchell in thanking you for this today and um, thanking everybody who tuned in to, uh, to, to hear all of your thoughts and hopefully learn something too. Uh, and Thank you for having me. <laughs> you're very welcome. Please awesome. come back, everyone. Yeah. <laughs> uh, we'll see you soon. Bye. Good night, everybody. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. That was quite interesting. Very yeah. interesting. <laughs> Oh yeah, there's the little donation page. Yeah, thanks for having me. <laughs> Our pleasure. Yeah.